Chapter 8 Blockchain versus Government Remember, Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin, encoded the following text into the Genesis block of the Bitcoin blockchain. The Times, 3rd January 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. Thus, at its very core, Bitcoin has always been at odds with the state-run fiat currency status quo. Satoshi saw government management of currency as corrupt and believed the only way to change the system that revolves around inflation and quantitative easing was to create a new paradigm for sound money that no longer required the intervention of state actors. The integrity of the new paradigm lies in the mathematics of the open source code that can be reviewed by anyone and the immutability of the code base that can never be hijacked by anyone for their own benefit. Coders can suggest directions to the protocol, but no change can be instituted without the adequate consensus from a majority of the community running the software. Of course, these anti-state control ideas have attracted to the cryptocurrency community many libertarians who believe in small government, if any at all. With the advent of drug marketplaces, scam ICOs, and fear of widespread money laundering via cryptocurrency given the lack of AML and KYC requirements, many criminal elements have also sought to take advantage of the benefits that cryptocurrencies provide. Thus, governments have always been on a collision course with the blockchain ecosystem. Bitcoin is designed to undermine governments by making it harder and harder for them to track financial transactions. The irony is that for so many years, the pendulum had been swinging the opposite way, with more and more cash transactions being replaced by credit card and FPOS electronic transactions. With the introduction of Visa PayWave, PayPal, Square and Apple Pay, and WeChat and Alipay in China, we are increasingly becoming a cashless society for whom most transactions nowadays leave a traceable record. This has of course been fantastic for tax collectors. Cryptocurrency transactions are designed to undermine these systems of control. While they may not be too useful currently, it isn't hard to imagine a time in the future when cryptocurrency wallets have become ubiquitous and a parallel economy operates simultaneously with the regular economy. Split a restaurant bill with friends? Pay them back in crypto. Pay your housekeeper in crypto instead of cash so she pays less tax and can give you a cash discount. Transferring money overseas? Pay in crypto. Have an overseas client? Receive the money in crypto so you don't have to pay tax on that income. Purchasing something on eBay? Pay in crypto so the seller doesn't pay sales tax and gives you a discount. It's easy to see how this gradual shift to crypto-based payments has the potential to completely undermine the government's ability to collect state revenue. The problem is, however, regulate as much as you want, it's extremely difficult to place a toll booth in between every node on a decentralized network. Short of turning into a police state and completely shutting down the internet, it's near impossible for a government to trace cryptocurrency transactions when they don't know the identities of the wallet owners. Although certain software companies are developing blockchain tracking technologies that trace money flows from wallet to wallet, it still requires a lot of guesswork and assumptions. One can imagine, much like how governments were unable to stop illegal downloading over peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent, regulating cryptocurrencies at scale is going to look like one more cop going against an army of Black Friday bargain shoppers at opening time. Content providers had to evolve, like Netflix did, providing a superior, reliable service for a reasonable cost that can compete and provide more convenience than the illegal options, eventually replacing the antiquated, unattractive operations like blockbuster video stores that disappeared in a Darwinian genocide. Governments and society will have to evolve to meet the new challenges that have arisen in this new paradigm. From a libertarian perspective, this brings to the fore the concept of voluntarism, which is the idea that participation in society should be based on free will to participate on one's own desire rather than being forced to participate under threat of violence, as happens under the current system. Violence, some readers may declare. In our society, the state-sponsored violence is merely implied and usually lurks just below the surface. But just try refusing to pay your taxes, or a fine for parking in a government-mandated restricted area. Sure, there is a civilized due process. First, you will be given an overdue bill, and then be given financial incentives, like interest penalties, to encourage you to pay the outstanding amount. 
Then, if you still refuse to pay, you'll be ordered to appear in court where most likely a judge will decide in favour of the government and you'll be instructed to pay the outstanding amount plus legal fees. If you still refuse to pay, expect either your wages being garnished because the government has complete control over the financial system, or you may be physically apprehended by the police forces who will incarcerate you as a penalty for your disobedience. That's the violence that reinforces the system and the status quo. Until now, because governments, as the most powerful actors in our societies, have always had complete control over the financial system and the issuance of currency, there has never been an option of not disclosing one's financial position. As we all know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Governments have never had to compete in the marketplace and have always had a monopoly on power, so they've never had to appeal to their customers or provide more efficient services, although in democratic countries voting does provide some recourse, but only to correct the most egregious corrupt regimes. If taxation suddenly becomes completely based on voluntary participation models, as voluntarism idealizes, does that mean we descend into a complete anarchy in a Mad Max-like apocalyptic dystopia with guns and random murders? Or does it lead to a better government where leaders are held to account and corruption becomes more uncommon as groups are forced to compete for the rights to provide basic services like roads, hospitals and schools, rather than possess de facto monopolies that maintain no requirement for striving to provide the best service? The answer to these questions are complex and uncertain at this stage, but either way the cat has got out of the bag already, Pandora's box has been opened, and we now need to be conscious of the 200-foot tsunami that's headed our way, because the new blockchain ecosystem has the potential to change everything. In the meantime, while governments still have some semblance of control over the financial system, Silk Road proved that its control is by no means 100%. They are struggling to first understand, then regulate this dynamic new paradigm. Every man and his dog do not yet have a cryptocurrency wallet, so currently it is not possible to survive on crypto alone. The fiat to crypto bridge at exchanges is still the weakest point, and that's where governments are focusing most of their regulatory energy, enforcing AML procedures and KYC regulations. However, what if fiat money continues to flood into the cryptocurrency market like it did in 2017? What if more and more people see the selfish benefits of cryptocurrency and equip themselves with crypto financial infrastructures like wallets, familiarize themselves with cold storage, paper wallets, brain wallets, and hardware wallets? Then it's going to become less and less necessary to convert fiat to cryptocurrency and vice versa. In the future, there may be a point where people will be receiving and spending more in cryptocurrency than they are in fiat, and that will be the tipping point. Of course, the scaling problems mentioned in earlier chapters have to be resolved definitively before we reach that point. The other side of the coin is the effect a public blockchain can have on government accountability. Publicly accessible accounting information provides the possibility of an until now unattainable level of financial transparency. In the future, governments could theoretically be implored to use cryptocurrency and public blockchains for their own financial management. Budget reports could contain cryptocurrency addresses attributable to each government department and each government employee, providing the ability for citizens to see every single detail of how their taxes are spent. Salaries, travel allowances, and capital expenditure can now feasibly be examined in the most minute detail and the contents considered reliable given their immutability. Of course, whether governments will be happy with this level of transparency is another question, answerable at the ballot box. But perhaps this would also give people more confidence in understanding that their taxes aren't being wasted and are actually being allocated efficiently. The fact that drives the growth of cryptocurrency that governments have to understand is its innate superiority to fiat currency. It is easier to store, easier to move, internationally recognized and accepted, and a great long-term store of value. Note the use of the word long-term, given the great short-term volatility cryptocurrencies currently experience, that could potentially act as a hedge against inflation because of its limited supply. In Bitcoin's case, there will only ever be 21 million coins. Of course, volatility cannot be ignored, 
but it must be understood that volatility has decreased over time as the continued existence of Bitcoin has proven its long-term viability. Remember, this is still a new concept and nobody is used to it yet, so price discovery still needs to continue for several decades as people fluctuate between believing and doubting the current value of the coin. The price for a digital token that has a store of value that is limited in supply and that is growing in demand with all the above qualities has not yet been determined. While governments scramble to maintain control of the financial system through traditional means, like SEC securities regulation, in an attempt to lasso the ICO horse that's already bolted, they have to be aware that they exist in a competitive environment also. This was proved by New York's first attempt at significant cryptocurrency regulation with the introduction of the Bit License, a licensing regime that sought to bring crypto enterprises into a regulatory framework. The unfortunate effect of the new license regime was that it actually had the opposite effect of what was intended. Instead of encouraging startups to set up in New York, the added red tape and bureaucracy discouraged businesses from setting up and saw a large exodus of companies who had already been in New York before its introduction. In contrast to New York, many other jurisdictions are intentionally maintaining a very light regulatory regime and openly encouraging blockchain innovation within their borders. For example, Japan decided to legally recognize Bitcoin as money, while places like Zug in Switzerland, Malta, Gibraltar, and the Bahamas have all promoted themselves as friendly jurisdictions where cryptocurrency companies can expect to find enthusiastic government support for their ventures, provided the companies create job opportunities for local workers. A good historical analogy of what can happen when governments openly compete with each other is detailed in the Jared Diamond book, Guns, Germs and Steel, that looks at comparative economic development and technological innovation and how it influenced the development of colonization over the past millennium. The main premise of the book asks why Europeans ended up colonizing the world instead of the South Americans. Chinese or Africans. One of the author's most interesting observations is that the Chinese were technologically and economically far more advanced than the Europeans in the 1400s. In fact, evidence indicates that the great Chinese admiral, Zheng He, had already led seafaring expeditions to every corner of the world long before the Europeans had developed their own sea legs. However, China's greatest weakness in comparison to Europe proved to be its centralized governance. It just so happens that around that time, a xenophobic emperor came on the scene who unfortunately believed that China had little to gain in exploring the outside world populated by uncivilized barbarians, so he issued an edict that forced all large ships to be burnt and destroyed and ordered that no new ones should be built to support future exploration expeditions. China was effectively cut off from the rest of the world as it chose to look inwards instead of outwards. In contrast, Europe was by no means unified under a single authority. In fact, it was an extremely competitive place at the time with many small nations, England, Spain, Portugal, Holland and others, competing for supremacy on the world's oceans. It was this fear of competitors and striving for improvements that really drove seafaring innovations. Developments like clocks, sail fabric, and scurvy remedies led to constant improvements in the distances that could be travelled and the ability of the European powers to outwardly project their increasing industrial and economic power. Thus, the ancient civilizations like China declined, being overpowered by plucky upstarts like Great Britain in later conflicts like the Opium Wars that made great use of Europe's greatly improved superior technology. Likewise, in this brave new globalized world of blockchain technology, governments realize that they can no longer follow the example of Ming Dynasty China and stick their collective heads in the sand, hoping that the revolution will just pass them by. Nowhere is this more evident than modern-day China, ruled by the Communist Party, which announced a ban on all domestic ICOs on the 4th of September 2017, starkly contrasting with Japan's domestic legislation encouraging blockchain innovation and startups. Despite the supposed ban, the government in China still recognizes the value of innovation and is encouraging its development, albeit on a tighter leash, as demonstrated by Huawei installing cryptocurrency wallets on all its smartphones. However, since then, China has focused on developing its own blockchain currency and has banned other blockchain currencies.
Many governments realize the potential of the space and recognize that we exist in a globalized, competitive world where many countries will happily step forward to fill the vacuum if any country chooses to stifle blockchain innovation within its borders. Because blockchains can exist and operate globally without a massive coordinated effort by countries to collectively act to shut down cryptocurrencies, governments are stuck with the same whack-a-mole situation they already face on a micro level, but on a macro, global scale instead. This is both the reality of blockchain and the beauty of blockchain, and why it will never be possible to put it back into Pandora's box. Blockchain is here to stay. The consensus of global opinion seems to be gradually accepting this fact, as demonstrated by the numerous global institutions, including the IMF, the G20, and the World Economic Forum, who have recognized the limitations of government control in this arena, and are starting to accept that there is not much they can realistically do to stop the blockchain onslaught. Regulation now seems more focused on limiting damage and containment, rather than complete prohibition, although some countries like Bolivia, Nepal and China are still trying to implement bans. For the most part, government regulations focus on the easiest to control areas, specifically the fiat to crypto bridge formed by exchanges that remains the weakest link. This involves forcing KYC and AML reporting procedures on crypto industry companies supposedly to prevent illegal money transfers by organized crime syndicates and terrorist financiers. However, there are still other methods for acquiring cryptocurrencies that are harder to control, like person-to-person -person exchanges on localbitcoins.com, although this website is now instituting more rigorous KYC procedures recently. There has also been increased effort to create decentralized exchanges, apps, and websites that facilitate peer-to-peer -peer transactions between market participants. Decentralized exchanges connect buyers and sellers directly so that the exchange doesn't actually flow through a third-party platform. One can imagine a decentralized future where one can just open up an app on a smartphone and using geolocation, locate all the buyers and sellers of cryptocurrency in one's immediate vicinity, making cash trades extremely easy to conduct. Many of these platforms would not even have AML KYC requirements, so trading could be conducted completely anonymously. In terms of anonymous platforms that don't require AML KYC, there are a number of websites that did facilitate crypto-to-crypto -crypto exchanges without the need for even creating a username or login. For example, as previously mentioned, Shapeshift.io allows users to calculate an exchange rate, send the indicated amount of the user's cryptocurrency to the website's wallet, then automatically receive an equivalent amount of another cryptocurrency to the user's nominated wallet address. Thus, users can easily convert Bitcoin to Ether or one of the many other cryptocurrencies. In fact, some wallets like Exodus.io previously integrated the Shapeshift.io functionality into their wallet, so converting currencies had become virtually seamless while staying 100% anonymous. However, this has now changed. While Shapeshift.io is now attempting to stay on the good side of the law by submitting to AML KYC regulation, initially it was 100% anonymous, their business model could very easily be replicated by other anonymous parties who seek to maintain the anonymous functionality this technology can facilitate. While governments are developing blockchain analysis tools that allow them to carefully examine money flows through the blockchain, jumping from blockchain to blockchain adds an extra degree of difficulty that makes it so much harder to trace where money has come from and to where it is going, as there are no connections between blockchains to indicate how one address may be connected to another via an exchange transaction. This makes the money laundering and taxation avoidance issues so much more urgent for governments to comprehend. If governments don't rapidly determine new methods and countermeasures for their taxation systems, they may be left behind. Meanwhile, taxation legislation has developed in various jurisdictions to clarify the legal status of cryptocurrency. However, different countries have differed in their treatment of cryptocurrencies, with some defining them as money, others as commodities, while the remainder see them more as financial securities. Just like the earlier example that focused on the differences between Chinese and European approaches to naval exploration and colonization many hundreds of years ago, the biggest hurdle to government control is the lack of coordination between so many different sovereign entities. Classic game theory comes into play as countries are faced with a prisoner's dilemma. 
maximizing one's self-interest at the expense of others. While some countries like China may crack down on cryptocurrencies and attempt to limit their use, so many other countries in the same vein as Malta, Japan and the Bahamas are vying to attract the potential windfall that being a global center for cryptocurrency finance could entail. Meanwhile, although the G20 and IMF have voiced concerns, they are far from creating a global concerted attempt at standardizing the international legislation governing cryptocurrencies. Given how difficult it has been for governments to reach consensus on emissions targets to combat the existential threat faced by humans in the form of global warming, reaching some kind of agreement on cryptocurrencies seems nigh impossible at this stage of the process when dissenting governments stand to profit tremendously by hindering such an agreement. Next episode of WTF is Bitcoin, the Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Guide for Dinner Parties, we'll be reading Chapter 9, The Altcoin Boom and will focus on some of the many different cryptocurrencies that have emerged in the shadow of Bitcoin and how to analyze the potential of new blockchain projects from an investment perspective. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't hesitate to like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast with anyone you think will enjoy it. It really helps us reach a much larger audience. <laughs>